So we've talked a bit in this class about the concept of nation state and what comprises a nation state. And we've talked about this concept of the politics of belonging, who belongs and under what conditions does someone belong. And what I want to explore in this lecture is just how nation states are built. You've been exposed to the concept of imagined communities and um, disciplinary regimes, but I really want to take a closer look and just specifically how nation states are constructed. And in particular, I want to do this through the lens of imperialism. And we've talked a lot in the class about this imperialism diagram and about the kind of interplay between modernism and capitalism and colonization. Um, all of these things come into play, in particular, when we're talking about the formation of the United States and the history of um, Native Americans in the United States. And so if we're going to talk about that, if we're going to talk about um, Native Americans within the context of settler, uh, in the context of colonization and capitalism and imperialism as a whole, it's important to understand this concept of settler colonialism, because it reminds us that we are, in fact, living on borrowed land. And so this passage is from a book called An Indigenous People's History of the United States, uh, it was written by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz in 2014. And um, this passage really kind of, I feel, defines settler colonialism very well. She says, everything in US history is about the land, who oversaw and cultivated it, fished its waters, maintained its wildlife, who invaded and stole it, how it became a commodity, real estate, broken into pieces to be sought, bought and sold on the market. The history of the United States is a history of settler colonialism, the founding of a state based on the ideology of white supremacy, the widespread practice of African slavery, and a policy of genocide and land theft. So basically, the United States didn't just kind of come into being. It wasn't this just sort of gradual, inevitable process. It was a capitalist colonial project that entailed taking land from someone else, um, using other bodies for labor, and really uh, entailed what I'm gonna define later as systemic institutionalized violence. And I wanna do this by, I wanna kind of show this by paying attention to something um, very specific, and that is the development of American Indian boarding schools in the US. So when the settlers first came, um, part of the real, um, one of the most kind of common tactics in order to take the land from Native Americans was through war. Um, and war and basically institutionalized mass genocide. Um, around the 1800s, we start transitioning from this institutionalized violence to basically institutionalized cultural genocide. And in the 17th century, a Puritan missionary named John Eliot begins these things called praying towns for Native American children, where they would be separated from their parents and be indoctrinated into Christianity. And it was this idea that um, adults are too set in their ways, so maybe if we can start with the children, we can kind of change them to start thinking more like us. And in 1869, and during the Grant administration, uh, the Grant's peace policy formalized these praying towns into boarding schools. And the primary reason for this was that it was considered more cost effective than war with Native American tribes, that to um, create these sort of uh, what they ended up being assimilation programs would be cheaper. And in 1879, so about 10 years later, the first off-reservation boarding school, the Carlisle Indian School, was founded by Richard Pratt in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And 
And by 1909, there were 20 off-reservation boarding schools, um, 157 on-reservation boarding schools, and 307 day schools um, in operation. So you have this proliferation of these schools specifically for Native American children, and their ultimate purpose was to assimilate them into uh, settler ways of knowing. And what's important to note is that Pratt and others like him considered themselves friends to Native Americans. They believed that their policies were um, kind of a more friendly, uh, sympathetic alternative to outright extermination, like what war was looking for. And so th because of that, they felt that they were uh, doing something that was in Native Americans' best interest, or at least that that's how they justified these programs. And so this is a photo of the Carlisle Indian Band at the Carlisle Indian School. And um, the board, this boarding school and others like it basically kind of operated like this. Attendance was mandatory. And so children from tribes across the United States were forcibly taken from their homes um, and were not allowed to return until um, basically early adulthood. Uh, parents who resisted would be arrested and imprisoned. Um, and basically, the kids would get into these schools, they would be um, taught Christianity, uh, they would be forbidden from speaking their language, and uh, given these sort of skills that was called assimilationist, but it was also a little bit more complicated than that. And it was really this thing called cultural genocide. So genocide means mass killing of a people, right? Um, in this case, instead of physically killing people, when we're talking about cultural genocide, we're talking about those other two elements of um, colonization, stripping people of their language and of their ways of knowing. So their cultural traditions, their spiritual practices and things like that. Um, and so, these were known as assimilationist programs, and uh, Jonathan Pratt actually coined this term that was, um, you may have seen it in the quote a couple slides earlier, this idea of kill the Indian, save the man, that we can um, assimilate Native Americans to make them more like us and, and essentially save them from themselves. And the, the Indian schools were, so the boarding schools were how this was gonna happen. And so children were brought into this and uh, forbidden from speaking their language, they had to adopt Western customs and traditions, and they were not allowed to speak their language. They could only speak English. The thing with assimilation, though, is that when we're talking about assimilation and race, a person of color can never be fully assimilated. So what ended up happening really is that um, schools kind of prepared native boys for things like manual labor or farming and prepared girls for domestic work. Um, they were sometimes leased out to white homes as menial labor, um, especially during the summers. So instead of being able to go back home to their family, they would be leased out to white families for labor, for cheap labor. Um, girls, uh, boys learned like things like farm work. Girls learned things like uh, sewing and washing and serving. And, and the reason for this, that there was such a gender division there, and this goes into the um, ways of knowing, is that gender is a way of knowing. And so what they were trying to teach these children was patriarchy, a system in which men dominate over women, which is not how a lot of native tribes really understood gender. They saw gender as something kind of very complementary and not necessarily binary. And so these programs were kind of trying to take that away from them and make them a more kind of uh, gender binary patriarchal culture. And this is kind of a, this is a couple stories here, a couple little vignettes from uh, Tate Walker, who did many interviews of survivors of um, boarding schools. And he tells a couple vignettes to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. So he says, uh, the first one is one gentleman I interviewed told how he was five years old and didn't want his hair cut, as was mandatory for boys arriving at school. One clergyman told him to get in line with the girls if he wanted his hair kept long. Staff gave him a pink rosary instead of the blue reserved for boys. 
He didn't think anything of it. Gender roles weren't so rigid for Lakota people as they were for Westerners, until the teachers and older students began to mock him and laugh at his long hair and pink rosary. Though shamed, he still refused to have his hair cut. He was beaten and blacked out. When he awoke, his hair, considered sacred by the Lakota, was gone. Um, Walker also kind of recounted the story of another woman uh, he interviewed. Um, and the story goes, I also interviewed a woman who said she watched as a girl in her dorm slowly died from a common cold because the staff didn't want to waste medicine on a child they thought was faking illness, and she was made to run extra laps in the morning. The woman said she and the other girls piled blankets on the sick child and pushed her bed up by the heater at night, but she was dead within the week and buried in the back of the school. And what stories like this really account is that... Um, these boarding schools, these assimilationist programs were not just um, work programs, they were very violent and the children there suffered a high level of abuse. Um, they were subjected to constant physical and emotional violence. They were stripped up from their family and these kind of tight familial structures that they had come to know and grow up with. Um, like the Like the girl in the story before they were had inadequate food and medical care so many of these children died from starvation and disease during their tenure in these schools and when i say disease as you saw from the um the previous slide disease could mean something as simple as a common cold like that's not something that we today would think that you could die from but in these schools it happened quite regularly uh, they were beaten for speaking their own language uh, for running away or refusing to practice christianity and sexual violence in particular was a huge problem in these schools and actually still is a, a huge problem in these schools. And in 1987, the Bureau of Indian Affairs issued a policy on reporting sexual abuse. So remember that the first one opened when the first one opened. It wasn't until 1987 that they had a formal system. And then in 1990, the Indian Child Protection Act is passed to provide a registry for sex offenders on native land, to mandate a reporting system, provide um, BIA and Indian Health Services for doing uh, background checks and potential employees, and um, to provide education on how to recognize sexual abuse. This is very late, 1990, but it was something. However, it was never sufficiently funded or implemented. And so what's happened is that sexual abuse rates on native lands have been kind of steadily increasing, even though that they've remained stable for the general population. So for all of us as a whole, it's remained stable, but in these areas, it's increasing. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the point of this, and what I kind of want to reiterate with, with this lecture, um, is that the formation of the U.S. as a nation state was an imperialist project. Um, in the acquisition of land, settlers, um, so our, who we often call our founding fathers, um, they established their own form of governance. They stripped children of their language and stripped them of their way of knowing, such as indoctrinating them with Christianity, separating them from their families and thus separating them from their cultural values. And so that the United States as a nation state, our borders, laws, citizenship, governance, all of these were built on systemic, institutionalized violence. Uh, these were violence acts that were embedded in our policies. Our policies supported them, our policies encouraged them. And it was all for the acquisition. It all comes back to the acquisition of land. So thinking about that imperialist diagram, how modernist principles and the, um, the kind of capitalist accumulation and colonization all came together, not just in how we treated um, Native Americans, but how the United States itself was even formed. This is really kind of the basis of our history. So these are my sources. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions about this lecture. Thank you.